Thank you, my friends. So, I've been working through the Gospel of Mark for a while now. I don't know how long. I just, I'm starting chapter 10 today. So we're going to be on, in Mark for probably a few more months, perhaps. I've got 12 verses today that I'm focusing on primarily. Uh, I will be doing a little bit of cross-referencing, um, but I want to begin by saying that some of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a bit controversial. There's going to be people in the congregation today that are not going to agree with me. There are going to be people in the congregation today perhaps feeling offended. But I will preach his word. Today we are speaking about marriage and Jesus' wishes for marriage. I struggled with it this week, actually, because, you know, I grew up in a very typical traditional household in which my parents were married. They had a healthy marriage. My dad's name was John Weston Phipps III. I'm John Weston Phipps IV, and my son is John Weston Phipps V. He married a beautiful woman by the name of Adele, who he referred to as Deli. It's nice to have my sister and brother-in-law here today. It was a good place to grow up, Dryden, Michigan. It was a good family to be a part of. My sister's a year older, and she beat me up until I was 12. <laughs> and now she's here. I pray she is feeling repentive about that, but... <laughs> she's not. I don't know what kind of family you grew up in or what kind of marriage was shown to you. But I had a really healthy marriage that I got to watch and witness. And I, I want to preface my message today by just sharing that if you didn't grow up in a, you know, a really nice family, you, you know, um, Maybe, maybe your family was blended or maybe the, the relationship of your parents was broken and maybe there was a lot of hurt in your life. I want you to know one thing. God heals. God heals. Okay. So I want to preface this by saying that and let's get into the passage of Scripture now. Jesus then arose from there, came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and the multitudes gathered to him once again. And as he was accustomed to doing, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? Next slide. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, my friends? Divorce was a controversial topic in Jesus' day. It's a controversial topic today. There's two main schools of thought centered around these two main proponents. Let's talk about them. The first school of thought was from Rabbi Hillel. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it right. This is a lenient and popular, let's call it liberal view of marriage. The other school is from Rabbi Shammai. Forgive me again if I don't pronounce it correctly. It is a strict and yet unpopular view of marriage. This will come up again, so please don't forget that slide. Now, they asked Jesus, who are they? The leaders, probably Pharisees, maybe some Sadducees. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The real point of the Pharisees' question is made clear in Matthew's account. Matthew goes one step further. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And you find that in Matthew 19.3. If the question is, is it lawful, then lawful is understood as relative. They want to know, basically... In Matthew, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Is it okay to be unfair to other people? Is it appropriate to divorce your wife? How will this affect your family, my friends? 
Well, the debate centers around the Mosaic Law that gave permission for divorce in Deuteronomy 24.1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that he finds no favor, she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found uncleanliness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce puts it in her hand, and sends her out of the house. That's a quote. That's a scripture. Deuteronomy 24.1. The debate among the rabbis tried to answer the question of what constitutes uncleanliness. What we're doing is we're cross-referencing, but we're being very honest about the particular passage of scripture of what uncleanliness is. And because the Pharisees and the rabbis didn't agree was because they didn't interpret uncleanliness the same way. Uncleanliness is relative. You may come to my house and think it's clean. I may go to your house and think your house is clean. It doesn't really make a difference. It's all in the eye of the beholder. But God's word does not return void. So I will stick with God's word, which says uncleanliness, and continue to unpack this with you a little bit more. See, the rabbi Shammai understood that uncleanliness to him meant sexual immorality. And said that was the only reason for divorce. But Rabbi Hillel understood uncleanliness to mean any sort of discretion. Even to the point of burning the breakfast being valid grounds for divorce. None of you would be married. I'd be the only one married still. Hallelujah. A wonderful cook, babe. Remember now in verse 2, they said they were te- the Bible says they were testing him. The Pharisees tried to get Jesus to speak against Moses so that they could trap him. They hoped to catch him in a, in a lie or a misunderstanding. He wasn't going to fall for that. Let's look at verse 3. And he answered them and he said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted Say permitted. Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but they are one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Initially, Jesus doesn't answer their question about uncleanliness. He's not worried about these particular schools that are arguing over the point of uncleanliness. But Jesus asks, What did Moses command? Jesus emphasized the heart of the matter from Deuteronomy 24.1. Jesus always goes back to Scripture, just like you should always go back to Scripture. It's not what you think, it's what God said. Always remember that. Moses did not command divorce, Moses permitted it. That's why I asked you to repeat after me. You said the word permit. Permit. This went against the teaching of Rabbi Hillel who taught that it was a righteous duty to divorce divorce your wife if she displeased you in any way. It's a false teaching, my friends. And yet it was practiced at that time. Gentlemen, where does your wife like to go out for lunch? Be careful. 
I don't mean to set you up. I, I didn't answer that for you. You said it. To, listen, I can take my wife to McDonald's anytime I want. I can. When I'm in a hurry, I'll take her through the drive through But there's not one item on that menu she wants. There's not one. Now, we'll eat the fries. Nobody complains about that because they are incredible. But I don't want that kind of marriage. So I take my sweet Dina to DeSesto's because I like being married. But some of you, I don't know who you are, but you're out there. You see, you give your wife McDonald's. And you don't even go in and you don't even actually have a meal with her because you're in a hurry, so you take her through the drive through It's good enough. You know I'm speaking figuratively. And you come to me for counseling and you wonder why your marriage is falling apart, my friends, because you're living a life like a couple who lives at McDonald's. You know, you can order food at McDonald's, and I think it costs about $8 for a meal these days. Is that right? If you get a combo meal or something. But you can go to a nicer restaurant and pay 15 or 20 And she'd probably love you a lot more for it. My point, this is not about food, my friends. Some of you are living the McDonald's life in your marriage when God wants you to live at the supper club. Some of you have said that McDonald's is fine, it's fast, it's cheap, it's good enough. Because I have learned that good enough makes my wife just fine and happy. Let me tell you something, my friends. It's not always good at McDonald's. And you can't eat there too often. And if you do, you'll die of a heart attack. And you might get divorced. But some of your marriages are more like McDonald's than they are the supper club. But sometimes, what you need to do is the small things in your relationship to continue to fan into flame that beautiful relationship that you have with your wife or your husband because it works both ways. So Jesus says, what did Moses command you Moses did not command divorce, he permitted it. You see, they wanted to be commanded because they were unhappy. If I divorced Dina for every time I was unhappy, I'd probably be married about ten times right now. Let's be honest. If Dina divorced me for every time she was unhappy, she would be married a hundred times by now. I am a piece of work. I know it. Some of you know it. Dina certainly knows it. But she doesn't give up on me because she loves me and she's committed to me. Now let me remind you, if she doesn't give up on me, how can Jesus give up on you? You see, the marriage relationship is similar to the relationship in which God calls the church his bride, and he's coming back for you. And when he comes back for you, you are the bride, and there will be a wedding ceremony, my friends, that will never divorce. Now, the rabbis in that day had a saying, if a man had a bad wife, it was his religious duty to divorce her. Jesus went against this way of thinking. In verse 5, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, Jesus says. The Mosaic law granted divorce was a concession to the hardness of your heart. It was never commanded by God, but permitted because of the hardness of your hearts. Verse 6, but from the beginning, Jesus says, this was not the case. Jesus now transitions from a talk about divorce to a talk about marriage. 
The problem was not that they did not understand the law about divorce. The problem was that they did not understand what God said about marriage. This is not an issue of divorce. This is an issue of marriage. I have had an aunt and an uncle, and they were in a race to see who could be married the most times. And I think it was five. Both, both five. Uh, w- one of them has passed. I did his funeral. The other one is still alive. If she lives long enough, she would probably be married six times. Let me remind you something. And you've heard it before, but wherever you go, that's where you are. Wherever you go, that's where you are. You see, if Dina's the problem, and I'm not the problem, and I get remarried, she's the problem, but I'm not the problem, and then I get remarried, and she's the problem, and I'm not the married. The, the issue is not divorce. The issue is the marriage. And too many of us are learning to be content with McDonald's food, which doesn't provide adequate nutrition for you in your marriage. When was the last time you held her hand? When was the last time you prayed over her? When was the last time you cooked his favorite meal and reminded him you forgot how much he enjoyed it? So you did it just for him. You see, this emphasis on marriage rather than divorce is a wise approach to anyone interested in keeping their marriage together. Divorce cannot be seen as an option when things are hard. Marriage is like a mirror. It reflects what we put into it. If someone has divorce readily in his or her mind as a convenient option, divorce will be much more likely. So Jesus says in verse 6, from the beginning, and I think that is very significant. Jesus says in verse 6, from the beginning, It's striking that Jesus took us back to the beginning to learn about marriage. Today, many want to say, we live in different times, or the rules are different today. We need a modern understanding of marriage. Jesus says, no, 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 no. What you need to do is focus on the beginning because God had an intention from you in the beginning, and God does not change his mind. We do. God is not stuck in his feelings. We are. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. God's real purpose for marriage is not fulfilled in divorce, but only in seeing God's original plan for marriage being fulfilled. In saying God made them, Jesus asserted God's ownership over marriage. It is God's institution, my friends, not man's. So your rules do not apply. God's does. It's kind of like this. I I, I choose to invent a new sport, and I want you to be on my team. I've invented the sport. I've created it. And decided it is good. You do not get to come on to my team and tell me how to run the sport. And yet that's what we do in our marriages. We want to tell God how our marriage should be. We can change the rules at halftime. We can blame the other person when ultimately we're only blaming ourselves because the two become one flesh. You see, the term joined together in verse 8 has the idea of gluing two things together. To be glued to her, a husband ought to be as firm to his wife as he is to himself. By firm, I mean connected. Dina is an extension of me because she is part of me. The term Jesus used is join together. Those two words, join together. 
is literally yoked together, like two animals that are yoked together over top with a yoke. Couples must work together and head the same way to really be joined and joined the way God wants them to be joined. You don't see animals splitting off from the yoke because they can't. You see, because God put them together. Here there is a new and overriding unity. The bond between a husband and wife should be even stronger than the bond between a parent and a child. The marriage bond should be stronger than the blood bond. These aren't my words, these are God's words. God joined you together. And the law of God was not that a man should forsake his wife whenever he had a mind to do it, but that he should for, rather forsake his father and mother than his wife. Loving his wife as he loves his own body. Oh, we've had a couple arguments over the years. It's usually starts out, you know, as a misunderstanding. It escalates. Dina has a really nice voice, very sweet. Gets a little louder. She played the tuba in band in high school, if that tells you anything. But then my voice escalates. I'm just being real with you guys. Look, don't pretend. You're not saints. I know that. You're saints in the Lord, but we're not perfect. She shares her opinion, and I share mine. And She says she's right, and I say I'm right. Next thing you know, it's at a place where it doesn't feel good. Before, doors used to get slammed, and that doesn't happen anymore. But I can tell you what does happen. When things escalate, I stop. I realize that I'm an idiot. It's not the first time, won't be the last. But I take her by the hand and I lead her to the bed and we kneel down and pray and she follows me like a little lamb. Now I know I've shared that with you before, but I wonder how many of you have done it too. Men, you are the priest of your home. You are the spiritual leader of your wife. God gave her to you as a gift. And for all the single people in here, listen, I want you to know one thing. If you had a wonderful marriage, praise God for it. There is no condemnation. I'm not condemning you for divorce. But I want you to know one thing. We're going to talk about what constitutes divorce. Because Jesus made it very clear that what God has joined together in verse 9 Jesus reminded the Pharisees that marriage is spiritually binding before God. Marriage is not merely a social contract, but as God has joined, He will want to keep together. People ask me, why is divorce so painful? You are ripping flesh from flesh, my friends. In using the term joined together and separate, Jesus reminded us that divorce is really like an amputation. Sometimes in the most extreme circumstances, amputation may be the right thing to do. But the patient must first have a diagnosis worthy of such extreme measures. Verse 10. We're going to close soon. In the house, his disciples also asked him against the same matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if a woman marries her husband, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. I've been asked this question more more than any other question in my 25 years of ministry since we started out in 1998. So in verse 11, it says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. We can only understand this passage by taking into account the whole counsel of God. 
In Matthew, there's a more complete recording of the teaching. He noted how Jesus said, and I quote Matthew 19, 9, I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The word uncleanliness that is found in Deuteronomy 24.1 showing that divorce and the freedom to remarry was only permitted in the case of sexual immorality. The ancient Greek word for sexual immorality is porneia. It is a broad word and it covers a wide span of sexual impropriety. One may be guilty of porneia without actually having consummated an act of adultery. To this permission for divorce, Paul added the case of abandonment of an unbelieving spouse. 1 Corinthians 7.15, if you're taking notes. He says, if an unbelieving spouse wants to leave, let her go. Or let him go. Note that incompatibility, not loving each other anymore, brutality, and misery are not grounds for divorce, though they may be proper grounds for separation. I'm rarely in favor of divorce, but often I'm in favor of separation when it's warranted with counseling. With the understanding that they will continue to date them each other exclusively, That doesn't mean they get on plentyoffish.com or whatever it's called and see what's out there. eHarmony.com, whatever the case may be. It means that they may live separately for a while, they are still legally bound to marriage, but they have gone back to an earlier phase of the relationship in which they are courting each other, they're simply dating to rekindle the fire again. It's a time to repent, to confess, to heal, and to see how God is going to move in their lives. And it's God's will for them. There are some that neglect the whole counsel of God and say that God never allows remarriage after divorce. But when we see what the entire Bible says on the subject, we see that if a divorce is made on biblical grounds, adultery or abandonment by an unbelieving spouse, I believe there is a right to remarry. You may disagree with my interpretation of God's Word. Many of you have been remarried. Many of you have sinned against God in your marriage. But I believe in a God of healing and restoration. If a divorce is not based on biblical grounds, the kind of divorce Jesus is referring to here, then there is no right to remarry. This is because as far as God is concerned, the marriage is still together. And to marry another person would be considered adultery. Well, one of the hot topics in our society today is from the LGBTQ community and, you know, same-sex relationships. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think we can talk about it here. It's nap time. There's pastors that rally in the pulpit against homosexual behavior because it's a sin and they're right to do so. But so is this really fancy phrase called cohabitation. It's just as sinful. Just because it doesn't repulse you doesn't make it less sinful, my friends. It's still living in sin. It's not much different than pornography. It's not much different from an emotional affair. My friends, you have to watch your life and doctrine closely. He 
You see, because God instituted marriage and gave it to us as a wonderful, beautiful gift, and he placed it in your lap, and it came directly from the hand of God, Satan wants nothing more than to destroy that. If it had come from you, he wouldn't care as much. Don't you know? But when God gives you a gift, Satan certainly wants to attack it. And some of you are hanging by a thread. You've been eating at McDonald's longer than you can remember. And now... It's time to leave McDonald's behind because you're not getting any nourishment. You're fat, dumb, and happy. And you're loving the fries and you're loving the Cokes, but it's not doing you any good, my friends. Sometimes you got to get the lobster tail. And I want a kind of marriage. That lasts. I do. Oh, we've had our problems. I know you have too. I mean, I've heard some of your stories. I'm not saying you all have. I think every marriage goes through ups and downs, don't they? But I'll tell you one thing. We're not quitters, are we? I won't quit on you. And I know you won't quit on me because you haven't yet. She forgives me all the time. And I forgive her all the time. And I have to show great patience with her because why? She is part of me. Who am I to give grace to myself but not to others? Am I so self-centered that I would love myself more than I would love the one that God joined and yoked me together with for the rest of my life? Now for those of you that are hurting because you're, you're widowed, for those of you this morning who are hurting because you're widowers. For those of you that are hurting this morning because you're here without your spouse, I want you to know my heart hurts for you. I still preach God's word. I didn't choose this passage. But if your loved one is sitting next to you, would you grab their hand? I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you happen to be one of those that are still married, maybe you're hanging by a thread. Maybe you don't know that you're hanging by a thread, but she does. That's usually the case. I didn't know she wanted a divorce. It came out of nowhere. My friend, you've been taking her to McDonald's for 10 years. You guys died of a heart attack a long time ago. As you're holding the hand, or maybe you wish you were, I think our marriages are so important that Satan wants nothing more than to destroy them. So stop looking at the faults of somebody else and see them as a child of God under construction, in need of improvement, not perfect, not glorified, but a reflection of yourself. And if you will do that and love your spouse the way Christ loved the church and died for it, I promise you, you will focus on her strengths and his strengths. And we will be reminded that we aren't perfect either. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and I'm not here to condemn. But I have to accurately and do my best to preach your word. When you called me into this, I would have been happy to do anything, anything else. But if I'm going to do it, I want to do it 100%. I don't want to preach half your word. I want to preach all of it. And I pray that you would strengthen the marriages. I pray that you would encourage the widows, the widowers. I pray that you would bless those who are on the brink of divorce or separation. I pray for those that are here without their spouse, 
who may not necessarily be believing, but they continue to pray and hope. We all have people within our families and aren't saved, and we continue to pray for them. I thank you for Park Place, and I pray that you'll continue to put your hand of blessing and favor on this special church and on these marriages and on these families. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You are dismissed, my friends.